Hello class, this is our recorded lecture for November 29th, Tuesday, uh, and today we'll be going over the endocrine system. And the endocrine system is the second greatest integrative physiological system controlling animal activities. The first being, of course, the nervous system, which we've already gone over. The endocrine system uses chemical messengers that travel in the bloodstream to target cells and tissues. Uh, so what are some of the general, uh, general ways that this differs from the nervous system? Well, we'll see as we get into it, but in general, the nervous system communicates relatively fast. It's fast acting. Uh, as we learned when we learned about uh, uh, action potentials. Right? Action potential takes place on the scale of milliseconds. Um, uh, less than five milliseconds, usually. Uh, even neurotransmitters, which are relatively slow compared to action potentials, are still quite fast, as they're traveling relatively short distances when we compare it to the endocrine system in which you have chemicals that are traveling sometimes nearly the entire length of the human body uh, in the blood. And so this is quite slow compared to an electrical impulse going uh, down a nerve, even if that nerve is quite long, uh, or across the uh, relatively small synaptic space as a chemical. And so communication in the nervous system is fast. It's direct things are directly plugged into, or nearly so, to their uh, target cells or target tissues, uh, such as innervation in muscles, um, our, our motor implants, uh, synapse directly onto the muscles, uh, neurons synapse directly onto other neurons, whereas in the endocrine system, um, uh, a, a gland, uh, the pituitary may secrete a hormone, a chemical messenger, uh, and its target tissue may be on the other side of the body, uh, and it relies on uh, the bloodstream, the circulatory system, uh, to get there. Uh, and in the nervous system, our uh, effects are relatively short-lived. Uh, we already took a look at... Uh, how action potentials function, and neurotransmitter communication. And so when a neurotransmitter is released or an action potential is uh, started, uh, these effects tend to be uh, short-lived. You can't have some long-term effects, especially with neurotransmitters that target G-coupled protein receptors uh, and have an effect on, say, the structure of, of, a, of a neuron. But in general, it's relatively short-lived when compared to the endocrine system. The endocrine system communicates uh, more slowly. Um, it's indirect, as we'll see. It travels in the bloodstream. It can be long-acting. Some of the effects of hormones, uh, they can last hours uh, and even some up to weeks uh, after they've been released. Now, I want to um, take the time to talk about um, a specific individual, a specific endocrinologist, um, who was thought to have completed the first uh, endocrine experiment back in 1849. Arnold Adolf Berthold um, conducted an experiment in trying to figure out what was the mechanism driving sexual differentiation in domestic chickens. So what we have here on the left <clears throat> are two chicks. And on the right, um, you may think that we have a, uh, a male chicken, a rooster, and a female chicken, 
a hen. Uh, but actually, we have a male rooster uh, and a male uh, capon or capone, as they're known, which is a male that has been castrated uh, before sexual maturity. And so you can see the stark uh, difference here in at least their morphological um, morphological features uh, and the consequences of simply removing two small, um, two small pieces of tissue while they're chicks. So a chick with intact testes will become a rooster. Uh, and if you remove the testes as a chick, you get this capone. Um, it's also important to note that in addition to our morphological differences, uh, capones have behavioral differences as well. They don't crow. Uh, they don't try to elicit copulations from hens. They're uh, uh, much less aggressive compared to roosters as well. So Berthold had uh, made these observations and wondered, you know, what is it about um, castration or these little pieces of tissue, the testes, that were responsible, right? In fact, are they directly responsible for this difference? And morphology. So he conducted a fairly simple experiment in order to determine this. Now Berthold uh, experiment uh, started with uh, neutering or castrating uh, young male chicks and its normal practice and what he found was that it resulted in the development of a capone, this specific adult male phenotype. Um, now, this practice, which can be done physically, physically removing the testes or uh, a chemical castration, is a practice that's been around for a long time. You might be asking why. Uh, why would people do this? What's the functional utility of castrating young male chicks? And so it's something that we know that peoples in ancient China, people uh, in ancient Greece practiced. Uh, and it's essentially to make them taste better uh, as a direct result of uh, the androgens, such as testosterone, and the indirect effects of the males being more active, it develops a, um, a d it develops a, an adult that has more tender, fatty, more flavorful uh, poultry meat. Whereas roosters, intact um, male chicks that become roosters, their meat is much more um, gamey and less flavorful. So it's it's just as simple as a, as a method that humans figured out a long time ago before we knew anything about modern concepts in physiology, uh, that if you remove these two little pieces of tissue, you end up with uh, an adult male that is quite a bit different and taste better. And the second phase of ex his experiment, he did the same thing. He took a chick and removed the testes. <clears throat> But uh, he replaced them, um, and the testes, uh, especially in uh, uh, young chicks, do quite well. They revascularize pretty easily um, and reincorporate themselves and become functional testes again. Uh, and the results were uh, the development of a rooster phenotype as the chicks emerge, uh, uh, matured. Uh, and then in the third phase of the experiment, 
he removed or ablated the testes and then he replaced testes from another individual into the chick and this also resulted in the development of a rooster phenotype and that this uh, experiment this general paradigm of 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 ablating a specific tissue uh, and seeing what happens and then re ablating it and replacing it are uh, two features uh, sort of two paradigms that are still the foundation of experimental endocrinology uh, if you want to determine a causal effect uh, in endocrinology of a certain hormone or a certain um, hormone producing gland you remove that gland or that hormone and you should expect the the resulting um, a developmental process or the resulting behavior to disappear um, and if that gland or that hormone was directly responsible for um, that developmental process or that behavior then replacing it after you take it away should restore that developmental process or that behavior and so this general paradigm is still used today uh, albeit in more often more technologically advanced methods uh, but still used to investigate um, the proximate mechanisms of of ind the endocrine system now i want to take some time to explain what hormones are now we've classified them uh, and uh, the five different characteristics of hormones first hormones are chemicals that are released from specialized cells uh, and we can see here two examples in the brain the pituitary and the pineal glands these are uh, contain specialized cells that release hormones and we have specialized uh, cells in endocrine glands uh, throughout the body uh, which we'll talk about in more detail um, later second hormones are are usually uh, usually secreted in very very small amounts um, we typically measure hormones on the scale of nanograms uh, or picograms a nanogram is one billionth of a gram and a picogram is one trillionth of a gram and so I've got a few sort of uh, sort of uh, um, conceptual examples here to help us uh, get a good idea of just how small that is uh, one grain of sand and about this big you can imagine a little piece of uh, grain of sand on your uh, on your finger this this one appears to be olivine which is a type of uh, as you can see a green uh, mineral um, which is uh, which you can find uh, at certain places around the world there's one in Hawaii that's known as a green sands beach that's rich in this uh, olivine uh, mineral uh, but uh, to get back on track it's the grain of sand pretty small the average grain of sand equals about five million picograms and so when we're measuring hormones we may measure concentrations that are as dilute as um, uh, a, a few dozen 
picograms per milliliter. So very, very, very small amounts of hormones. I've got a different way that we can conceptualize uh, just how uh, how small the amount of hormones are that are circulating in our bodies. So um, I want you to take a guess of how much testosterone do you think is circulating in every human being at this very moment, um, which is about 9 billion people. So if we could magically take all of the testosterone that's floating in every human being's blood right now, adult, child, male and female, and we put just the hormone, just the testosterone in a container from 8 billion people, how big would that container be? So you can uh, take a guess for yourself, and then I'll tell you. Um, it's enough to barely fill three pints. So this is how much testosterone there is right now in every human being on the planet. The third characteristic, hormones bind to receptors that target tissues. Uh, hormones would have no effect physi on physiology, on development, nor on behavior if they did not have receptors to bind to. Um, an example here pictured is an estrogen receptor for binding uh, estrogens, of which there are uh, three primary ones, estradiol, estriol, and estrone, all collectively known as estrogens. So all hormones bind to some kind of a receptor, a protein that they connect with. Um, and depending on the type of receptor, uh, hormones can induce a variety of different uh, cellular, molecular, um, and also transcriptional changes. The fourth characteristic. Um, or actually, before we move on to the fourth characteristic, still thinking about binding to receptors, many of our hormones bind to uh, G protein coupled receptors. Uh, and this allows for hormone, uh, that initial signal uh, that is sent out via hormones, it, it allows for that signal to be greatly amplified, many orders of magnitude more. Uh, and that's because one hormone interacting with one protein-coupled receptor um, can stimulate um, the, the, the release or the uh, can stimulate uh, many different, or not many different, but uh, many replicates of the same enzymatic pathway. So it can, it can uh, stimulate um, many, many, many copies of the same uh, enzyme or molecule that will go on to initiate other cellular reactions, uh, such as a cyclic AMP. Um, so just it takes one hormone, and it could give rise to hundreds or thousands of, of cyclic AMP mobilization that's going to go on to, and each of those are going to uh, induce a specific chemical pathway or process. And so hormone signals can amplify uh, relatively quickly. The fourth characteristic is that all hormones are transported in the vascular system. And what we have here is a, um, is a human uh, vascular system uh, that's been preserved uh, using probably some kind of plastic or latex that's been injected into the vascular system and you can really see um, all of all of the uh, veins and arteries and all the way down to um, the small capillaries uh, and so we don't quite appreciate it just ha uh, how extensive 
our vascular system is, because in most illustrations, it's not nearly as um, not nearly as uh, detailed as what you see here, because it often would would obscure other organ systems that we're interested in sort of visualizing. But this is what our vascular system looks like. It's you know quite literally everywhere, and so hormones can reach um, every every tissue in our body. Um, and this is a, this is an important distinction, uh, that if it's not traveling in the vascular system, it's not considered a hormone. Uh, and in fact, there are some chemicals that act as neurotransmitters and as hormones. And the difference is, is how are they being, uh, how are they traveling uh, to their target cells if they are being released by a neuron uh, across a synaptic space to interact with receptors at another neuron uh, or perhaps another target tissue across a synaptic space that is an, a neurotransmitter but you could take that same chemical and if a neuron releases it into the bloodstream and that chemical travels through the vascular system to another tissue and interacts with the receptor, it's then considered a hormone. So hormone versus transmit a neurotransmitter, um, that distinction is simply, is it traveling across a synaptic space or is it traveling in the bloodstream? Hormones travel in the bloodstream. And our fifth a characteristic. Um, they regulate cellular processes. So this includes metab metabolism that we've discussed before in class. Um, so hormones are involved in facilitating, mediating, and modulating conversion of food to energy, conversion of food and energy into building blocks for cells and tissues, elimination of waste products, um, any kind of cellular process revolving around uh, metabolism, hormones, um, can affect, or often affect. They also, in addition to metabolic processes, they can um, modulate, mediate gene transcription, which is um, the coding of, or the copying of DNA into RNA, and eventually translating that into a protein, which we've discussed before. And so hormones can target specific genes, and they can either increase or decrease their transcription. They can essentially turn on a gene or turn off a gene. Um, and this is particularly the case for steroid hormones, which include estrogens, androgens like testosterone, um, and what's commonly known as the stress hormone, cortisol, and other glucocorticoids. These are all, it's known as steroid hormones. Uh, and they very often act as uh, gene transcriptions in which they interact with a receptor um, and they get transported into the nucleus uh, via the actions of this uh, uh, receptor interaction. And they typically form, the hormone itself forms a complex with perhaps that receptor or with other proteins uh, that bind to DNA and facilitate transcription or perhaps um, uh, prevent transcription from happening. So they can suppress transcription or they can induce transcription. So hormones are quite powerful. Now I want to talk a little bit about hormones and behavior and emotions, because we often think about this relationship between hormones and behaviors and emotions. Uh, and we know that hormones uh, can influence behaviors and emotions, um, not just in uh, humans, but in animals. And it's a little trickier measuring horm uh, measuring emotions and behaviors. Often we're measuring. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it can be a little tricky measuring emotions in animals. Uh, and often what we're doing is we're measuring behaviors and using that as a proxy 
to 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 infer an emotional state. Um, the way we do this in humans is we ask them questions about their emotional state. Um, but we also uh, take a look at behaviors and physiological states, which can give us inferences that match up with these emotional uh, states. And we do the same thing with animals. We can, we can um, measure sort of like fear-like behaviors that give us an inference that they may be in, a, in a, an emotional fear state, for example. But uh, this example we have here is in humans, which makes it a little bit easier. And so this was a, a, um, a study done uh, with individuals at the London Stock Exchange. So uh, these are uh, day traders, people that are trading stocks, tra uh, uh, selling and buying stocks within very short time frames on a, on a daily basis to try to make a profit. Uh, and so what they did was they, they took measurements of concentrations of testosterone during... Uh, the morning before their workday began, and then correlated that to their profits for that day. And we lump individuals into two two groups, the groups with relatively high concentrations of testosterone and those individuals with relatively low concentrations of testosterone. We can see a significant difference, albeit with some variation and overlap. But on average, um, individuals with higher testosterone tended to do better than, on average, individuals with low testosterone, suggesting a connection here um, that testosterone may be directly or indirectly influencing their day trading behaviors. Uh, it, it, one of the things that testosterone does in terms of how it, in fact, it affects animals behaviors is that it tends to decrease risk aversion and increases status seeking behavior in the specific behavioral outputs of this really depend on the context sometimes increasing status seeking behavior might necessitate more aggression but not necessarily um, this idea that testosterone leads to um, makes animals more aggressive it's not quite clear cut as that. What it, what it really does is it, it increases status seeking behavior uh, and decreases uh, the risk of aversion. Uh, another example here of just the, the, um, um, the, the converse. Uh, not only do hormones influence behaviors and emotions, but we see that behaviors and emotions influence hormones, concentrations of hormones. It's a two-way street. Behaviors affect hormones, and hormones affect behaviors. Uh, another study that was measuring T and spectators before and after the 1994 World Cup. <coughs> Um, and this was, uh, this World Cup was uh, Brazil and Italy. Uh, and Italy was uh, a favorite to win. Uh, and so they, they measured testosterone levels before the game began, just uh, of, of individuals that were there watching the game live uh, in the arena. And so as we can see here, um, that uh, Brazil, the triangle, uh, had slightly lower concentrations of testosterone than, than Italy, um, but this difference was not significant, significantly different. Uh, and after the game, we can see a, sharp, uh, a stark change in the order, and also what emerged was a significant difference, whereas those individuals that rooted for Brazil, the winning fans, uh, saw an increase in testosterone concentrations, and those individuals that were rooting for Italy, the losing fans, they saw a marked decrease in concentrations of testosterone, which were markedly less than uh, the, the fans that were rooting for Brazil. So compelling evidence here that there is a connection between um, an emotional state and 
the the hormone concentrations that you uh, experience subsequent to some kind of emotional state change. Now, it's an important um, it, it, an important uh, a, a very important uh, foundational concept that that we should always be aware of in in a chronology. Um, and it comes from this question of do hormones cause behaviors or emotional states? Um, can you inject someone with some kind of hormone, hormone X, and this will induce a very specific behavior or this will induce a very specific emotional state, right? Like uh, if you inject someone with anabolic steroids, are they going to experience uh, roid rage? Are they going to experience hyper aggression uh, and become violent, for example? Um, and so the short answer is no. Hormones, hormones do not cause behaviors and emotional states, but it's somewhat subtle. Um, what's important to know is that hormones increase or decrease the likelihood of a particular behavior or emotional state given the appropriate cues. And we'll see examples of this in the next video, in the next section of our lecture today. So hormones don't cause behaviors. You can't inject someone with, say, testosterone and give anyone 100% guarantee that it's going to cause this behavior or this emotional state. What it does is it may increase the chance of, let's say, aggression given appropriate cues. So individuals, so um, a professional bodybuilding, taking anabolic steroids is, is, a, is, is a key integral foundational part of modern professional bodybuilding. Right? All professional mod modern bodybuilders take anabolic steroids. Um, it's impossible for the human body to develop that amount of musculature without this hormonal, exogenous hormonal intervention. And so doing this, um, this practice of anabolic steroids use is often associated with uh, hyperaggression, um, increased temperature, uh, temperature, increased temper, um, increased volatility, uh, with things like rage and violence, um, and hence the term roid rage, which comes from steroid uh, and, and rage. Um, and this is true. This is a true link, a true um, correlation and association. But the, the anabolic steroids don't cause that behavior. What it does is it increases the likelihood of someone um, becoming enraged or, or losing their cool, losing their, temp their temper, in, in the correct context or in a, in, a, in a context that would stimulate that. So taking anabolic steroids isn't going to make someone like sitting on the couch and they inject with anabolic steroids and then they just become enraged for no reason. What it does is it sort of shortens their fuse. It makes it more likely that they will um, lose their, their inhibition and their, their executive function when presented in a context of something that irritates them or, or makes them angry. So the steroids themselves don't cause rage. They, they increase the likelihood of that manifesting within specific contexts. And we'll see other examples of this, different examples of this in, in the next video.